The first is just answering the question, does this council want to engage with other regional planning councils? The second is, how would you want to do that? Which councils and on what topics? And so you have in your, in your notebook, and I'll switch to it, and I'll kind of switch back and forth. We have the, the regional planning map. And so you can see your adjacent councils. Uh, you can see really that many, much of your water originates within your basin. Uh, but there are other areas that you impact. You impact the Coastal Council. You have some shared resources with the Altamaha Council. You have a little bit of shared with the Lower Flint Ocklockney. <coughs> and within you, of course, the Suwannee Satil and the St. Mary's Basin. And so from, from looking at it from that perspective, again, you know, I'll ask, um, are there, do you, first, do you want to, do you see a benefit in interacting with other water councils? Yeah, I'll just open up the discussion a little bit. Uh, Lee and I, we've had, and Cliff had some loose conversation about this, about bringing this before the council. Uh, obviously, I think we, we would benefit from having discussions with Coastal because we do, our watersheds do um, terminate in their, in their well, the, some of our watersheds, two of our watersheds terminate in their council. So um, I'll open, let's just open the floor up for some discussion on if we want to maybe look at Lower Flint or Lockney or even Altima Hall. But um, my personal feeling is this Coastal is almost a no-brainer. So. so one question I would have, since the majority of our water use basin is groundwater. The Flint tends to use the Flint River for their water use. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's not accurate. That's not accurate. Okay. So I guess that would be my question is should we look at other places that are using groundwater, other councils, maybe to just kind of see what they're doing as well? Well I think that the um, if you're asking me about that, I, I think that the lower Flint uh, their issues are going to be very similar to ours, although theirs are a little bit more ramped up. They have a little bit more severe issue down there. Um, one of the things is the way the aquifers are done, our structure is down that way. But how they affect the Florida region, um, and we've had some discussions with the Florida councils, so I think that we have some relevant um, issues between the two. So, yeah. Brittany, just to clarify what yeah. you had said about yeah. the Flint's use of surface water. 1,800 permits in, in the Flint Basin as opposed to five the surface water permits, 5,000 groundwater permits. Okay. That being said, what's important is the irrigated acreage really would be you know, less than, you know, conservatively would be 25% of the irrigated acreage. It's not even that much. So overwhelmingly, Groundwater use. Okay. Thank you. I, I feel sort of like Scott. I think actually uh, the Autumn Hall and the Lower Flint, I think we all need to work together because we all got similar problems down in the south, southern part of the state. So I think it would be a good thing to have conversations with them. Wouldn't, wouldn't our, uh, some of the uh, water basins, um, believe it or not, and Ben Hill County is kind of unique because Ben Hill County had, uh, or has a river that runs on the north side of it, the Okmuggy that goes to the Atlantic. Uh, on the on the Okmuggy side. And then the Satilla obviously runs away from the Oak Muggy down through here. And then the Altamaha Hall that goes also at the edge of Hill County runs to the Gulf. So um, most all of the, the waters that originate, very few of the waters that originate in our district run to the Oak Muggy. They almost all run either, there's a few in Ben Hill County that are they're very small, but the rest of them run to the Satilla and the, uh, the uh, Altamaha Hall, I mean the uh, Alabama Hall. With a coochie, with a coochie. So we all go to correct, and we all have the same areas which we, we, we leave out sometimes of our thought processes just because of its location, but it forms the Georgia Florida 
uh, line That's right. on the south uh, southeastern side of the state, and it runs towards the Atlanta. And obviously, everything in that southeast corner is is uh, forming the uh, St. Mary's. So um, now I'm biased because the old buggy is basically a part of a part of my home. Uh, we, it's very important watershed for us, in my opinion. Uh, the groundwater that is coming through our region actually surfaces around the Old Mogi. So there are other discussions to be had about water usage of that way because it directly affects groundwater in our area. But uh, so I think I, I think talk with a, all three of those are probably. Recharge area for our applicants from all of those. That's correct. Yeah. The fall line, basically. Uh, yeah. And and <coughs> that's why the groundwater situation is probably more important as far as Oklahoma goes than the surface, you know, even the surface water discussions. Although, like I said, you know, that's my county right there where the, the dove buggy makes a bend, so it's in our, our county but not in our region. So I, I have some personal bias there. The groundwater, without doubt, is, is a, a viable discussion, I think. Yeah, why, why don't we let Cliff just talk about some of the permits, just so you'll get a feel for the, each basin. Yeah. The, uh, the Swanee Sotilla, we have 2,073 groundwater permits. Right now, that's 196,000 irrigated acres. We have surface water. We have uh, 3,800 surface water permits irrigating uh, 235,000 acres. We have 279 well defined systems for about 26,000 acres. So, by permits and irrigated acres, we have more in the more surface water being used in, in the Swanee Satilla. Let me tell you that back. We got more permits for <laughs> Swanee Satilla for surface water than we do groundwater. What was the surface water again? Surface water was uh, 3,800 permits, 236,000 acres. What, what, what does that equate to by volume? Well, we don't have volumes associated with ag permits. We only have a rate and the irrigated acres. However, you know, the ag forecast put, put out there the crop types that, that you would find and the percentages throughout the counties and the regions and um, using information from the University of Georgia, we have formulas that we use that we could estimate whether it's an average year, dry year, or wet year, how much those crops would need and, and how many irrigated acres we have, and we could, we could arrive at an estimated uh, number. But I don't have that. Okay. And I have all the counts. If, if there's other questions on how many permits, whatever yeah, council I, have, and what are they? I can I can do that too. I, I'd like to know Altamaha and the coastal. Let's start with Altamaha. Altamaha has uh, 1,100 groundwater permits, 120,000 acres under groundwater. Surface water has 2,300 permits at 157,000 acres. Well defined systems has 220. 25,000 acres. Coastal, I'm sorry. <coughs> the 220 well defined, how many acres? 25,000. Coastal, we have 190 groundwater permits for 20,000 acres. 340 surface water permits for 29,000 acres. 30 well ponds for 4,000 acres. And Randy, since you weren't in, in this count, so I, the, the average, um, yearly average
put that in perspective, Jacksonville uses 380 million gallons a day. So that's roughly the same. That's a permit. That's permitted. That's correct. Uh, that's always been the question. It's permitted. Well, actually that, use that, that, that's actually what the figured use is on the crop. That was what we. That was what all that exercise was. The, really, the question is, is the consumptive. You know, that's uh, that was that was Dr. Hook's averages <coughs> for what kind of crops were growing and what the water being used on. Uh, but that is at the fully consumptive rate. They're assuming every gallon that you put on that crop is consumed. So that's uh, there's there's a discussion on whether that data is all that accurate. But really, in the big scheme of things, consider the size of our region. It's pretty, uh, and that's over an entire year. So some of our issues happen obviously when irrigating is going on. That's the yearly average on a seasonal seasonal usage. But um, it's the uh, best data. I'll get you the answer to yours. I'm just having to do some conversion. Yeah. Let's do it some <laughs> Scott, from an agricultural perspective, well, that, that's a good start point, Cliff, with the number of permits and all. But that doesn't tell you, that doesn't give you any idea how much water is used in agriculture. And that'll vary with the crop. I mean, you got a produce crop that makes in 50 to 60 days. You won't get near as much water with it as you would a corn crop that takes you 120, 130 days. And so on. I mean, it just. It's, Another thing I'd like to say to add to what Dan's saying is when we originally got our permits back years ago, the general thought among the farmers was to figure high because you wanted a permit that would allow you to use your maximum use. So, I mean, my opinion is that it's probably a high figure. Uh, and that's the reason why we have to, that in my opinion, you have to look more at Dr. Hood's work uh, that took the average crop. Now, that was five years ago, and crops changed, but I think that's why that data is much. If you took the 100,000 gallon, uh, what is it? Threshold 100,000 gallons the 100, a day. Yeah, the 100,000 gallon per day threshold on those, all those permitted wells, it'd probably be a much larger number. So I think Dr. Hook's data is probably closer to right than if you just took permitted data for reasons like you're saying. We have we know you, we know people that have permits for a well that never runs. So uh, we certainly don't want to take that into account. So I think I, I, although there's definitely some issues with the data, I think his way of saying you know this amount of acres of, cro of cotton were grown and this amount of acres of water are grown and that and the, the issues you're talking about that. Uh, this is the difference in the water needed for those crops. I think that's probably the, the most accurate data for what we're talking about. And I really think it's it's probably, in my opinion, it's it's um it, it doesn't tell a bad story. Uh, it tells a better story than the permitted number because you know that that's what got people the knee jerk reaction. They saw the permitted number and they were like, oh my goodness, look at all this water. But I think once you look at it, and that's why I related to Jacksonville, the 400 million gallons a day is a yearly average, and that that's not near as much as the permitted. Scott, will, uh, we be able to have some update on that data? I, I think we need to. Really, I mean, obviously, before we approve another plan, I think we have to have that because there are um, You know, there's a crop shift. You know, there's been a crop shift. Uh, and the other thing that maybe Cliff address this would be the shift in uh, you should call it technology. Techniques. And BMPs, best yeah. practice. As far as uh, you know, the type of irrigation systems they're using now, I know what I see is a lot of it is what I call uh, low pressure, low impact, uh, therefore more of a prescriptive water use versus uh, you know, just put it out there. Let, let me. So there's two things you want to be, you want to address. You want to address the update to the ag forecast. Let me do that in a second. Yeah. First thing would be conversions, retrofits, irrigation technologies. And, and would we have any update on uh, the uh, meter, you know, the, the work that the soil and water conservation is doing uh, on you know, getting meters in place and getting those read on a timely basis, that type of be interested to see where we're at in that process too. 
Okay. Yes. What? And one of the things that I'd like to do, I'm going to interrupt, is I want to make sure that we leave here today with a list of questions that you all have for EPD regarding information you need to review and revise the plan. And so this is a good start to say these are some of the things. What, where are we with this, with this ag data? What else do we know? Looking at um, retrofits, looking at metering, what, do we, what have we learned from metering? Has any more of that been done? Are we done with that? And we'll um, you know, compile a list and I will send that back to EPD and say, here's what this council needs to know. So. Clear. Yes. You, have have you all developed any sort of uh, data for trend lines since I think we've been in existence now for nine years or so, something like that, uh, for, uh, let's say, aquifer levels compared to population growth, compared to uh, projections for, for best projections for water use uh, since since inception so we can take a look at, at what has happened in the last nine, ten years or so compared to uh, what we what our plan showed. And not just for our area, but for, for I guess this data this data maybe is being I don't know, is the data being kept by by council area? Yes, it's actually uh, it's being done by, by region. So, so is there is there some a, way we can we can look in a simplified format of, of what what has happened maybe in the last ten years compared to data and compared to uh, uh, surface water volume availability and, and groundwater uh, levels. Yes. Now that'll all be affected by things like you're talking about by crop changes, technology, and and uh, you know, and all sorts of weather, you know, all sorts of factors. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, that's, that's what we're, that's what we're, I think that's what we're here for, is to look at the availability of the quality of the water. So I'm just wondering if, if that data is available to us. We can then say, okay, it went up, it went down, it got better, it got worse compared to what, what we've done. I, I will say this, and for the, those of you that might not have been in the last meeting, the, the our plan is being used for permitting. I mean, it, uh, those BMPs are being followed, so it would be nice to see possibly what might be a direct result of the BMPs. Um, I don't think that you will see a comprehensive study like we got the first time, you know, like Dr. Hook's study. I don't think that, that, that the state will pony up for that for just a five-year revision. But there, there certainly is USGS data, water, uh, water table, and that kind of stuff. But a, but a ten year time frame, I think, is you know, I mean, it's pretty short. Yeah. But it, it's a beginning to see, you know, what what's happened. Uh, actually, what's happened to the to the resource. You know, maybe we can somehow figure out how to evaluate whether or not we've been affected. Or not. So the charge is, is what we've done for council to provide input on these deliverables. Part of that request needed for the council would be, uh, and Wei Zing is in charge of, of, of specifically what Rusty was talking about, have Wei Zing talk about essentially yesterday, today, and the future in a 10 year framework yeah. in order for the council to move forward to make, to make decisions. You know, for instance, when I think we should go talk to customers, but one of the things that they're you know, really going to be affected by that we're not is, is, uh, is some more in the future. And so, uh, you know, we're supplying them with an awful lot of water, uh, but, you know, they've also got the, the more they use, the more hydrostatic issues they've got to do with. The metering issue, too, Wei Zing, I work closely with Wei Zing on the metering data that I receive from the Solar Water Commission, and, and we receive that once a year. Uh, it's read once a year. They do have a pilot program where they read about 100 sites on a monthly basis. And we're trying to see what kind of data that would give us. Of course, the Solar Water Commission is limited by, by money as well. And, uh, however, we have gotten new data, and that's being, that's being integrated into the surface water model. So at the same time that Wade talks about, comes to talk about, you know, the models and what it looked like yesterday and today and the future, he can address how the metering specifically integrated into his models and what that's telling us today as opposed to yesterday. I'll also be curious to know whether or not there's been any, any change in the, in the 
red zones? Of the coastal red zones or the flat? Anywhere. Or the flat? Anywhere. Okay. Not just the coastal. I mean, I know you're talking about impairments. They got a they got an issue they got to deal with in terms of salt water, but anywhere. So the one update yeah. I can give you on coastal right now is um, they are looking to actually have reductions in groundwater withdrawals by 10 million gallons a day uh, by 2020, by 15 million gallons a day by 2025. Uh, there are 41 permittees who are going to be working towards those reductions. And basically, where we had had the red zone and the yellow zone, it's all red zone now. The less groundwater they, they use, right. you know, the, the better it is for them in terms of salt water, but it's less demand on water that comes through, comes through our air, wouldn't it be surface water, subsurface. I think those are things that right. I was not aware that they were working towards those kind of changes. It would be, it'd be good information. And to address the uh, irrigation technology component of your question. State or EPD does not does not put, put state allocated money towards those retrofits. However, there's a, quite a few federal programs that do, and there's uh, the state arm for implementing. Some of those. Uh, so the, uh, the NRCS is the primary driver behind those irrigation technology programs, and then over the Flint, you have the Flint River Partnership. They apply for these federal grants. So. I've been asked for a number of years to quantify the, the water savings through those retro dips. And in order to get that information, I'd have to go to the NRCS. And, and EPD being a regulatory agency doesn't get a real warm reception. But you know, the NRCS is successful because of its relationship with partners and, the, and its ability to keep that information private. But when I ask for it, that, that, that's, you know, that threatens their business model in a lot of ways. So we're working, I'm working with Brent Dykes the other day at the Soil and Water Commission and, and uh, Terrence Rudolph, who's a state conservationist, to try to figure out, you know, I, know, I understand the, the law bars, bars you from releasing certain information, but what can we do to get more information on that? Because we, we hear from you guys that, and we see it out there, that all of these retrofits, have, and all of these folks are doing, uh, you know, retrofits and irrigation technologies to use less water and to, to have uh, more efficient in impact and in uniformity of application. It's just that when you ask for the number, that's where things get get a little squirrely. Um, that being said, um, we'll see we'll see what we can come up with for the next meeting. Uh, that I'll go to the Soil Water Commission and the NRCS and say, hey, what what could you give me today that would um, that would would illustrate the impact you guys have had in your programs within this region? So, uh, because a lot of folks are doing it, so uh, I, I, I even, can try. Even if it's not in gallons, if it's percentages, okay. then, then you can begin to see if you have, have an impact there. Uh, and granted, it wouldn't be as good as you know, the actual gallon, but you, you know whether 10% of make conversions or, or what. Yes. The other thing is, uh, you know, when it's, speaking of technology, it's, uh, probably have more on the ag side of doing more uh, prescriptive watering as in their better use of potentiometers and other things that uh, they're measuring, you know, the profile of the soil, knowing where the water is at and where it's critical to have it at, and then can that be more prescriptive? How much water do I need to put out to do that? And therefore, you, you're reducing both the <coughs> water The other question I have too is as we have continued to come out of the recession, uh, has it had an impact on uh, <coughs> projections on populations, that kind of thing within our, our region? You know, did something occur within during that?
extent of recession that has changed people's ideas of you know, moving and has it had a positive negative or is it no change in, in the population projections in the long term? I think all of that is part of the overall trend for the last yeah. 10 years that we, yeah. we'd like to see you know, what, what's been tried. And OPB will be providing new population projections. Um, and, I'm not sure of the exact timing of their and, and release. Probably pictures were a thousand words. If you could just see a graph that shows you what the previous projections were, what they are now, then, then you get a quick glance at, you know, has it changed, unchanged, expect to be more or less. And if there, if there are any, um, I guess, Cliff, is there, has there been any uh, changes in EPD regulations as far as uh, waste treatment facilities that would have a positive and negative impact on, on water use that time? Okay. Of course, that kind of plays hand in hand too with populations. I, I think we'll see a revision in the um, municipal you. Yeah. Uh, utilization, not to mention that we're going to hopefully have a new uh, wastewater treatment plant in the region by that time. So there, will, there should be some, that data should come through. And part of that would be, you know, whether it's land application based waste treatment or it's what I call conventional. And a lot of these towns uh, have federal money available and grants available to update their water systems and they're doing it. Some of them are doing it on their own, so we'll, we'll, a lot of them have changed since the last time. Because, you know, uh, Rusty, you were talking about 10 years, but I think if you remember when we started talking about it in 2008 or 9, that data was almost 10 years old. So it's actually uh, early two, late 90s, early 2000s. So it's probably more like 15 years old. So th there will be some changes in some of those numbers. Now, the municipal data was not. The municipal data was, was fairly up to date. But some of that other data was fairly old. So. But, you know, I guess it, when I first heard the numbers, Cliff, when you were talking about how many withdrawal permits, uh, you were talking about 190 groundwater or 20,000 acres. You were, you're speaking strictly on agriculture. Correct. The Ag Water Demand Forecast, right. you, you, you asked that too. Yeah. That, there are plans to be updated. Uh, it's largely going to focus on the irrigated acreage changes uh, since 2007, 2008, because that's when the baseline was done yeah. uh, for that forecast. Uh, again, this is going to be important for your input because, because of the limited time and scope and uh, money available for the forecast, it was pretty intense in the first round. The, uh, the, the current models plan to, to just maintain the current, or the, the assumptions made about forecasted cropping patterns. But what we're hearing is that cropping patterns may have changed. Um, you know, we got, we got pretty lucky that first round, and then it was a coincident, coincidental culmination of a number of different sources that provided information on that. All of that with regard to what types of cropping patterns University of Georgia was turning in two year reports on cropping patterns per county. Um, USDA has projections that they update yearly, but they base them on 10 year, 10 year projections. And there were a number of uh, crop models that were put out at the same time as the, the ag water demand forecast. Um, some of those things are not available today, uh, some of them are not even being done. So the plan at this point was not to update the crop model, uh, but to continue with the assumptions made the first, the first ag water demand. However, to pay attention at what type of irrigated acreage changes had happened since the first time. So uh, we know those are degrees. Yeah, we believe that if we put that into the model, Greg is not here right now. He's probably drilling a hole somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Being said, so when I simply, simply when I say what well, we were planning to do changes to uh, to the cropping patterns, we're just going to look at the irrigated acres. Council has to think about whether they want to say something about that or not. Yeah. The Water Planning and Policy Center out of the Albany uh, Albany State University area has been contracted to do this update. Uh, 
they'll also be updating the uh, the nursery forecast as well as well as the animal agricultural uh, numbers that we had. Um, and all of this work is being done it's starting now. It's going to be done this summer, and it's going to be uh, go through the fall. So by the end of the year, we're going to have the data to be compiled along with summary information on the metering information or the metering program to produce a database on ag water demand at different scales. That being the update on the ag water demand forecast will, will be done by region. It'll be done by node. It'll be done by county. All of that the same way we had it, we had it done the first time. Um, and so, and we're going to have a, uh, a report describing any changes in the current use compared to uh, the information that we got out of the 2009-2010 first forecast. So, you know, the, the council's charge is to provide input through this process on the steps that we're taking to move forward. And, and, I, and I know I didn't give you a lot of detail on what it's going to be, but you pretty much got it. That, going to be done by all of the sub-regional planning scales um, as well as it's going to be focused on ir irrigation changes, irrigated acres changes. Um, that being said, you know, I think we've heard loud and clear that you guys need to be looking at cropping changes too. Um, so we have a we have a contract with the Water Planning and Policy Center um, that is to address the issues I just told you about. And, you know, I can always go back and talk about type of cropping issues they're going to have and, and part of the information they'll collect out there when they're doing this is I, I give them targeted areas that's where I've seen where I've seen the, the irrigated acreages uh, explode um, you know we have to break them down into areas that's manageable for their team manageable under the amount of money the state's allocated for us to give them to do it uh, and they, they're pretty comprehensive when they go out on site and List about as much information as you can possibly imagine out there. So we'll have to have to get them to look at some of those cropping patterns and see if they know of any that's been changing. Mark Masters, as many of you know, um, is an economist and uh, assistant director of the Water Planning and Policy Center. He's the one that's going to be uh, the lead contractor in gathering this information and putting these forecasts, the update to the Ag Water Demand forecast together. If I need to, if we need to have him come talk about that after we can do that too. Is that something y'all would like? It's kind of an update from him of what he's looking yeah. at. Maybe we can look for the next meeting to invite him to come and then y'all could give him some feedback on things that he may not be considering. So that's great. I want to step back just for one minute because I want to make sure that we're able to cons comprehensively put together this piece for EPD. And I think what I've heard you say is there are several councils that you feel like it's important to engage with. The Coastal, uh, the Altamaha, and the Upper Flint. Lower, lower, lower Flint, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Let's kind of prioritize that if you don't mind, guys, because as you can see, uh, that they're wanting to know something about September. Right, and well, this is really the time period of how you would work with them between now, or really between, say, October 1 and the next October. So this is just, we want to we want to lay out kind of your goals for how you would, you would coordinate with them. Some councils have said, we're going to send a representative to just listen in and see, you know, and understand what's going on. Some have said we want to, you know, and we want to and, and also invite those council, other council representatives to come to our meetings and give us updates on what's happening. Um, some have said we want to uh, have the chairs coordinate and just provide a, a good understanding or create subcommittees that may meet together on specific issues. So there, I think they're a broad range and I think it just depends on the depth of engagement you're looking for or that would be beneficial to this council because while it's, um, while I think we're gonna have you know, councils, you know, all the councils are going to be looking to engage in different ways. And I think what you want to do is determine what's going to provide you with the greatest benefit, the best information as you look to do uh, revisions, and where you think they may be impacting you the most and where you may be impacting them the most are kind of, kind of how I've thought through it. And so I think, you know, Scott, your point to kind of prioritize um, is good because, you know, y'all you, are limited in your time and ability to, to go either visit the other councils or have, 
have other meetings, and so we do want to make sure that we kind of propose to do this in a way that, that will be most meaningful to you all. Well, most of that, and I think that's great, has to do with upstream or down, somewhat downstream, but we've encouraged you all in the past to, to do everything you can to have an interactive relationship with Laura. So uh, I'd like to also suggest to you that you continue that, try to continue that relationship and, uh, and bring back something to us uh, about, you know, what do they see, what are their problems, what what's happened to them in the last 10 years, where do they think that they're going So people here today, that, you know, which I'm glad to see, uh, you know, from Florida, but I, I'd like to also encourage y'all to, we do all we can do to try to be good neighbors with her. I'm glad you brought that up because we, we are still in contact with them. We, we talked to them since the last meeting. I mean, or in the Scott, Scott and I, will, I'll let Scott tell you what, what we did down there and then I'll follow up with what that sort of yesterday and I can sort of talk about today. Yeah, I, I, we did that before the last meeting and I updated the folks over the last meeting, but Cliff and I actually went down and visit with the folks in Florida at their um, water district and, and there's a little bit different in state funded water district so it's a little bit more of a uh, coordinated effort, a uh, government coordinated effort but we went down there and, and had a, a good discussion about our uh, our impact on, on, on them and things that we were doing and things that we would like to do as far as possible uh, implementing some of the things that this plan said would help us in our efforts to help them, uh, which is basically uh, impaired streams and surface water issues. Uh, but, um, and then since that meeting, we've talked again about uh, actually trying to implement some of that stuff Cliff and I have been working on. Um, you know, we're not making probably as good a progress on that as we would like, but we've at least got the discussion started and what possibly Florida's uh, involvement in that could be, and also, um, their support in what we're doing because I think it will take a little bit. I mean, obviously, if we're trying to go to the state and say that we, we want to do these things to help out this situation, it helps to have Florida on board to say, yeah, this is actually something that we're interested in. So, And I'll let Cliff talk about that just a little bit because he coordinated that on the telephone. We did that until that wasn't an in-person meeting. The other time, the other meeting was Cliff and I went down there and uh, spent half a day so uh, yeah at the time they had transitioned the new leadership in, in terms of their executive director they had, had a, a rather new one I believe she'd been on the job about a year um, she has since been hired by the St. John district so she'll still be in the region she's moved to another district that Swanee district is currently um, uh, I believe they'll, they'll have to find a new executive director and pretty soon uh, they currently have an interim who has been working with me closely since, I guess, about 2006. Carlos serves the interim director of the Swanee District. I've been working with him and pretty close with him. And He's come to a couple of meetings. He, they, they've come to meetings. They couldn't make it today. He had another engagement he had to be at, so he, he couldn't make it today. But I do keep him involved in what's updated on what's going on there. And he keeps me updated about what's you know, here and what's going on there. So. Um, so it's not, we are still in contact. Now, all that being said, you know, we have a lawsuit on the south, on the, in the western side of Georgia and, uh, with the Northwest District and, and the Lower Clinton O'Clock. Some say that doesn't impact what goes on with us, but it does when you ask attorneys. And attorneys believe, well, you know, we know this is going on over here, but you, you, you might want to just. Uh, pace yourself and the things you say and what you're talking about um, with, with one another until we get this thing settled over here on the western side. So um, so I guess what, what we do from this point forward with that district, probably I have to run, run through some channels to make sure what we want to do, what we want to say, and how we want to interact, interact is, is, is still okay, however, I think, I think it will be. Uh, I just have uh, you know another lens to look through now, the legal lens, whenever we talk about interacting with uh, St. John District and uh, and the Swan District, but uh, up now we're still still in close contact with. Them. We're we're speaking pretty much orally, um, and, and Cliff's right. The legal legal ease has slowed the progress down probably is, but it hasn't slowed much of the discussion. 
you know, I think most of our, we had a good understanding of what, of what uh, how we affect each other, and, and so I don't, you know, I don't think there's an issue there, but, but as far as like doing things that would facilitate improving those situations, I think that's probably what's slowed down the most. Um, yeah, Lee, you want to? Uh, yeah, I would say, um, so with the Alton Hall, the Coastal, and the Lower Flint, are there any others? We talked some about the Buggy. Yeah, the old Buggy is actually the uh, Alton Hall. Uh, and, and actually, we could do them different. We could do each one of those different. I, I think it would be okay to have one representative, but maybe for uh, the Lower Flint, maybe we want to sit in on one of their meetings. I don't know that's what we want to get from you guys. Uh, the Altima Hall might be another situation where one or two of us want to go or, or have representation. But, um, you know, at what level do we want to participate in their meetings? Let's try, kind of determine that and which one of those do we do we want to do that with? Uh, I, I think until we get the ball going, I think our chairman, you ten meetings and if the chairman sees that we do need to start having a council or something, bring it back to us and say, but uh, with you and Cliff working together, uh, I think I'll just continue what you're doing and, and touch base with everybody and then if y'all see that we need to do something different, tell let us know. I do attend all those their meetings. Uh, obviously it being ag ag based. I talk to them about their permits for the two but not, not like I do here, but uh, they have questions at the last meeting. I probably I had staff do six, about six data requests of information during the meeting, so they're they're very active. Um, and just so the chair, future officials know, I'll be there and um, can can bring back any information in the event some somebody can't make it. And that's specifically the lower class that you were saying. Yes. It, if I'm asked to go to more, I, I will. And I went to all of them during the first one because we were doing the forecast and might end up doing that again, depending on how that forecast goes. But um, but it's hard to be at all of them. Well, and, and like I said, Scott, you know, when we're having these meetings, you see that you're going, if you need somebody else to go with you, it's fine. But like I said, I think if you go, I think Cliff will go with you. Yeah, we'll try to, we'll try to, maybe we'll, in the next few months, obviously before next year, we'll try to get to maybe those three. And then if it looks like we need to bring more or there's a bigger discussion to be had about how they affect our, um, and it's probably, it's probably gonna be groundwater more than anything, obviously, how they affect our groundwater situation. And maybe we can expand it from there. But if, if everybody's fine with just uh, staff and, and, and the chair, whoever that might be, because like, Said that might change, but uh, if everybody's fine with the staff and chair going, then we'll do that to start with and see if we need it. Is that okay, Lee? That's great. Thank you.